Okay. All right, stop your fellowshipping. I know. It's too much greeting. Stop stop saying things to each other. So, we will we'll have more we'll have snacks and things and you can fellowship some more in a little bit. So, Okay, great. Yeah, good to good to see everybody. Uh, we're going to continue on a little bit with our uh, with our series that we were talking about, uh, the church, of course. And remember that I sent out uh, some texts and things to all of you of your spiritual gifts. Some of you responded immediately. Some of you took a few days. Some of you have not responded yet. If you uh, if you don't respond, that's okay. Not not, not punishing you. <laughs> um, but but if you'd like to, I, I would love to do that because uh, it is something that we're kind of discovering who we are. And I want you to discover kind of who you are again. And I know some of you have taken, you know, those uh, those types of surveys and things before, and and that's cool. And so you may have already known, but then that you know kind of lets me know a little bit better too. Um, as we begin to progress and as we begin to grow, then you can kind of look at this as okay, this is kind of you know my ministry and who it is that I'm discovering. Because that, that is kind of what we have been talking about now for weeks of who we are. You know, everybody say it with me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I stand complete in him. And so, uh, so this is kind of part of who, you know, discovering who we are. Next week, I'm going to kind of go into it a little bit more. And I'm not going to call you out, you know, if you want to share, you know, kind of what you've been discovering of of you know kind of what your spiritual uh, gifts are and, and things that's perfectly fine we'll have a chance to do that uh, but we'll be looking um, kind of more at definitions you know if you feel like you're more servanthood driven or if you're more exhortation or service or uh, you know prayer or intercession or whatever we'll kind of be looking a little bit more at those uh, within that. So I, I just want us to kind of get comfortable with that a little bit. So if you haven't had a chance to take the survey, um, please go out and take it. If your link didn't work, let me know because I messed something up and some of them didn't work. So so I tried to correct that and I tried to send them out to everybody uh, in there. So so we will be uh, we'll be doing that and, and all too. So, uh, so kind of keep that in mind uh, a little bit. We're going to go into that. Okay, so let's continue on. So we've been talking about the church. I want to talk about uh, the tale of two temples tonight and uh, what we're kind of discovering. Remember uh, how it was that the church came together and then they were starting to expand and we're still at the point with the chapters that they're still kind of in Jerusalem at this point. And um, go on to the next one here. So uh, Acts 3, 3 through 5 uh, the apostles started going out and they started doing some miracles and things. They got in a lot of trouble. They got arrested. Every time that they get arrested, they're sharing the gospel. They're sharing, you know, what Jesus is, is doing. And they are sharing Jesus as the Son of God. And so they're, they're doing that. Uh, as they progressed on with Acts 4 through 5, uh, they came together with all things common. They began sharing all of their uh, possessions and things. This is where you find the story of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to God, basically, and God struck them dead because of that. You know, they were supposed to, uh, they went out and they sold a parcel of land, and then they brought it to the apostles, and they said, you know, this is all of the money that we sold the land for, and they lied to the to the Lord, and he killed them, okay? So we're not going to go into that a whole lot. But, um, but when we're looking at this, remember that Luke is the one who wrote Acts, and as he begins to go in here, he is looking at two different temples. I'm um, going to the next slide here. So as we look at two temples with symmetrical design, Luke begins to write and he writes about two different temples. He writes first of all about the Jerusalem temple and it was a corrupt corporation. And then he begins to write about God's new temple, the community of Jesus and the followers gathering daily in the temple courts and from house to house. So we're going to look at these two temples, we're going to kind of contrast them, and we are going to use as figureheads two different people who uh, 
who kind of were involved in these two different temples. So what we've got is we've got the Jerusalem temple that is a corrupt corporation, and then we've got the new temple that is actually the body of Christ and them that are ministering together. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so here's the dilemma. And I know that these are a little bit uh, small here, so don't worry about that. But the thing is, is that this screen right here is bigger than this right now for me. <laughs> so what I do is I put my scriptures up here so that I can read them better until I get a large print Bible, which I haven't gotten yet because they're incredibly expensive and ridiculous. Okay, so anyway, so in those days, when the number of the disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, this is the same thing that goes on now. You know, it's like when we come together in the church, uh, one group will complain about another group sometimes. And in this particular case, what's happening is that there were certain people that were being overlooked and they were complaining about it. It doesn't matter what type of a group that we come together at. Every time that we come together as a body of believers, there are people that believe that missions are very important, right? There are people that when we come together believe that the young people are very important. There are people that uh, when we come together believe that kids ministry is the most important. Right? There are people when we come together that believe that uh, sharing the word of God is the most important. There are people when we come together that say worship is the most important. And all of those things are important. It's all of those things working together that makes up the body of Christ and makes up the church. And so this is nothing new. So what happens is that they come together. So remember that the 12 apostles, the disciples of Jesus, they are the ones who are kind of the head of the New Testament church at this point. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and they said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now this seems very haughty and it seems arrogant and it seems very prideful. But when you actually dig into the Greek and see what it is that they were talking about, they are talking about diakonian. There are two places in the word that this word is used. And it means service and waiting on tables. One of the places is here in Acts, Acts 6. And the other place was when Mary and Martha were talking to Jesus. And remember that Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to everything that he was saying. And Martha complained and said, hey, why is it that Mary's sitting there listening to you and I'm trying to get supper ready here and she's not in here helping me, right? This is the word that she uses of waiting on tables or serving. Nothing wrong with that. Those are the only two places that it's mentioned in the word. So what happens here is that the disciples come together. They said, okay, brothers and sisters, choose seven people among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. That's very important. It's going to be important in just a second here. Full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The disciples were not saying that it was not important to, to minister to the widows and the orphans and to feed the poor. But they were saying, just like we were talking about tonight, there's not one person that can do all of those things. See, I, I can't get up here and speak and sing and do kids ministry and do uh, young people's ministry and be a missionary and do all of those things because I'm only one person and you can't do it either. But when, as we're looking at our spiritual gifts and we're looking at what God has called us to do, we are diverse in the body of Christ, just like we've been talking about. You know, remember the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We are diverse in the body of Christ like that because we all have a purpose. We all have different abilities and different talents and all that we are going to be able to minister together. You know, if, if you have uh, a group of people that you are invested in and maybe it's your neighborhood or whatever and you start a small group, you are going to reach those people better than I can. And that's okay. If you do that, let me know. You know, I'm not opposed to that. Uh, because you can reach certain people that I'm never going to be able to reach. You know, hopefully, maybe they will come together with the body of believers here. Uh, but maybe not. And that's okay. But we still, we're ministering to different people. So this is what's happening in the early church here. So, so the apostles wanted to devote themselves to the ministry of prayer. 
and to, uh, to ministering the word, and then they needed other people to do some of the administrative tasks of actually taking loaves of bread and fish and all that kind of stuff and handing it out to people so that they could eat. Wasn't saying that it wasn't important, but they said we're different in that, okay? Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, so this proposal pleased the whole group. So they chose seven guys. They chose Stephen, who is full of faith in the Holy Spirit. They chose Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, who converted to Judaism. So they put seven guys in charge of this. These are the ones that are going to feed the poor and take care of the widows, take care of the orphans, and take care of the administrative area of the church so that the apostles could be freed up to go out and to minister the word and to evangelize and to, to bring people in. So they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, so this is kind of where we are. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, so let's look at these two temples. So that's a background and that's a setting of where we are right now. So we've got the corrupt temple. This is the religious organization. You have people that tell you sometimes, uh, maybe at work or, or whatever, oh, you're, you're a religious person. And I try to always say, no, not really. I'm really not. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm not really a religious person. Why? Because religion speaks of rules. And Jesus speaks of relationship. It's much different, you know. Uh, we have all experienced religion. We have experienced religion even in the context of Christianity and different churches and things, where even those people who are away from what they would term as nominal uh, religion or nominal denominations or something feel like they are almost superior sometimes because, well, we don't do, you know, what, what this group does of, you know, worshiping statues and, you know, saying the creeds and, you know, all of that kind of thing. But the thing that I've found is that many times we become religious within our own right because we still have certain rules and things that we feel like we have to follow in order for us to please God and for us to get to heaven. And that's just as much religion as it is over here saying, you know, we have to worship all the saints and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Very same thing. And so, uh, so what happens here is that we have got a temple at this point in history that is corrupt. There, the high priest is Ananias. Now, this is not the same Ananias that we were just talking about with Ananias and Sapphira, but another guy named Ananias. There was basically three or four different guys named Ananias in the Bible. And uh, as you read through them, they are distinctly different people. This is Ananias. His name was Annas. And then but some people called him Ananias. But he was the high priest of the Jerusalem temple. He was the high priest of organized religion. And he was the godfather of the Jerusalem temple. How many of you have ever seen The Godfather? Nah. One of my favorite movie series. Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Godfather 3. Love them all. My kids always said that I raised them off of The Godfather. <laughs> you know, of, uh, of certain things, you know. Keep your, uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Leave the gun take the cannolis. You know, there's, there's, there's certain things that we have to learn from the Godfather, you know, within that. Okay. So Ananias, he was the Godfather of the Jerusalem temple. Now, when I say that, I am not, um, I'm not saying that lightly because he was a very corrupt high priest. Israel had uh, leaders and prophets and kings and things that were extremely corrupt all through their history. Ananias was another one. The thing about Ananias is that he was not so much called of God, but he was appointed by Rome to be the high priest in Jerusalem. Now, now think of this. Rome was the uh, conquering army of the Jews, right? They were the ones that came in and basically, for, for the most part, enslaved the Jewish people at this point in history. And so they were the government oppression 
It would be the same thing in the latter 1930s and the 1940s of the Nazi regime appointing pastors in the churches, which of course they did at that point. This is the very same thing. And so Ananias was appointed by Rome and he was a godfather. He was corrupt. His sons who were also high priests were corrupt. And uh, they had a corner on the market of corruption going on in the temple at this time. This is the same time that the church is beginning to grow and, and the church of Jesus Christ is now expanding. And so Ananias is corrupt. He, uh, he's taxing everybody constantly. He's making them pay more than their tithes that are supposed to be. You know, back, back here, uh, when they came together in the temple, they had to make sacrifices, right? They had to make animal sacrifices. Guess who owned all the animals that were supposed to make sacrifices with? Ananias and his buds. And so what was happening is that they had a corner on the market. They basically said, <clears throat> you cannot come to God without this sacrifice, but you got to buy the sacrifice from us. And this is what was going on in the Jerusalem temple at this point. And so he, he, was, he was kind of the godfather of the Jerusalem temple. Let's go on to the next slide. So he officiated as a high priest from about uh, AD 47 to 56. <clears throat> he was appointed by the Romans. And Hervé, who was a, uh, a scholar and a theologian and a scribe and a historian, uh, he described him as a violent, haughty, gluttonous, and rapacious man. And yet, he was liked by the Jews. See, the Jews also had this type of history, too. Remember Saul? We're talking about Saul and David, right? God was content to lead the children of Israel himself, and he wanted the prophets to lead them. But all of a sudden, Israel says, hey, everybody else has got a king. Why can't we have a king? Right? That's, that's where we make the first mistake. Everybody else is doing this. Why can't we? And that's exactly what happened with Israel. So what, what the Bible says is that they chose Saul, who was head and shoulders above all the men of Israel. He looked like a king, but that wasn't God's best. Later on, God would bring in David because he had hidden David off out, out there with the sheep and he was the one that God chose. But Saul looked like a king. He looked like the one that he was supposed to be. And all the people in Israel said, why can't we have Saul as king? Well, we all know that it got in a lot of trouble that way. Same way that it was here. Ananias, he was the high priest. He looked like a high priest. He was religious. He was arrogant. He was pompous. He had his robes. He paraded around through the streets. And the people liked him. That's the way it is with us. That We fall prey to that a lot in, uh, in the United States. And, and the thing is, is that we, we, have been, we have been down and we have been on the wrong side of the tracks as Christians for so long that any time that we have anybody who stands up like a celebrity or a politician or something like that who names the name of Christ, it's like we fall for that. Oh, they're on our side. They're playing for our team, you know. Yay, right? And, and a lot of times it's our own insecurity because we're not comfortable in who we are as a Christian. And we want to be validated. And that's where the problem is. And this is exactly where the Jews were at, at this point. Now, they looked up to him, even though he was corrupt. He was a godfather. So we had the corrupt temple with Ananias there. Then all of a sudden we have the correct temple. Out of the corruption steps a man called Stephen. Go ahead and go on to the next one. Now, Stephen was a man that was full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Remember that Stephen was not a pastor. He was not a, uh, an apostle. He hadn't seen Jesus. But the Bible says that he was a man that was, that was full of grace and power, and he performed many great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue at the free, at the free men, who they were called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of uh, Cilicia and also Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against his wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. 
this is encouraging for you and me. Because you and I are not going to be smart enough to win every spiritual argument with a person. I've met some, some young people that were atheists who were extremely indoctrinated and knew a great deal about atheism and, or they were agnostics or, you know, whatever, or, or in, in cults or in false religion. And uh, they were extremely indoctrinated, indoctrinated in that and very intelligent in those things. I'm not going to be able to argue with them with that. And neither should I worry about that. But the thing is, is that in those situations and in those times, God will give us by his spirit, wisdom and grace and power in order to minister to the people that we can minister to. Because as I've told you before, they can't dispute your experience. This is what I used to be. This is what I am now. You know, we can, we can argue the theology all we want. <coughs> and uh, we, always had, we always had, you know, all kinds of stupid discussions in Bible college about various things. You know, well, you know, how, how many angels fit on the head of a pin? You know, and just, just ridiculous things, you know, that, that we would go through. That didn't mean diddly squat. And so this is the way that it is. So what, what the point of this is, is that we have to allow God to give us wisdom in whatever situation that we are in. And a lot of times, the way that he can give us wisdom is sometimes if we just close our mouths and listen to him. Um, sometimes we're very quick to argue with people. Let's, let's say, for instance, you're sitting around the break room at work and the subject of religion or the subject of Jesus comes up or whatever. And, and we are very quick to want to be right and to express our side. And we don't sit and listen a lot of times. We don't sit and listen to the person and understand where it is that they come from. I remember uh, one job that I had and I was in the uh, in our room where the employees are in. And um, I'm trying not to give this away and tell you what job it is. So, that, you know, if anybody watches out there that they'll know. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so, so I was there and I, I had this guy who knew that I was a minister, even though, you know, I'm working for a secular company at this point. He knew that I was a minister, but he just hated God. And, um, and I asked him one day, I said, I said, why? Why do you hate God so much? And we were able to sit there and have a conversation. Well, because this happened in my life and this happened in my life. And, you know, this is where it lead, led me and all of that type of thing. And I sat there not condemning him for hating God. See, we, we get nervous for God. God's got big shoulders and he can really handle things himself. You know, if, if it destroyed God every time somebody blasphemed him, we wouldn't be serving God because he wouldn't exist anymore because he was destroyed because somebody blasphemed him. You know, this, the very creation that he created blasphemes him. Guess what? God can take that. He's got big shoulders. It's okay. He doesn't need us to defend him. He just needs us to share him. It's a deal. And so that's the way that it was this day. And I sat there and I listened to him. And I talked with him and I shared my experiences with him and I never condemned him for hating God because I understood. I understood why he did with some of the things. And, and you have people maybe in your family or that you work with or that you come in contact with that are the same. And you can understand kind of where they're coming from. But if we will sometimes be quiet and let the spirit give us wisdom like he did Stephen, it'll go a long ways. And we'll be able to reach people more and more with that. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so remember Proverbs 15 along these lines. A gentle or soft answer turns away wrath. Have you ever been in a volatile situation and all of a sudden you just kind of step in and you're the voice of calm and you're the voice of softness and you're the voice of reason and immediately it kind of shuts down that whole conversation? It shuts down that whole area there? Why is that? Because a, a gentle answer, answer or a soft answer is going to turn away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. If, if you go off with the profane, profanity begets profanity. 
When you're around people that every other word is the F word, and then all of a sudden you feel like you need to reach them, so now you're sharing and yeah, okay, well, I'm cool. And, you know, I'm using the F word too because, because I want to be a Christian that's relevant to them. You know, that doesn't work. Never has, never will. Profanity begets profanity. Stephen King's mom, everybody know Stephen King? Okay, Stephen King's mom said one time, uh, she said, profanity is the language of the ignorant. And it is, you know. And the, and the thing is, is that when we become profane and when we start speaking profanity, it's a lot easier to continue to speak profanity, right? Okay, but a soft answer turns away wrath and a harsh word stirs up anger. It stirs up things that are in us, even physically and biologically. You know, that cortisol begins to flow. And we, we experienced this this past week, if you, if you watch the Academy Awards. You know, it's like once that thing kind of begins to flow, then, you know, we got we to gotta bring it or we're not, you know, we're not who we, we say we are. You know, and, and that's the way that it is. And this is what Proverbs tells us. The tongue of a wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish gushes folly. And so as Stephen was talking, if you, if you go and you read the chapter there as he's uh, talking to the people, he basically, he started back with Moses and he just, he just went right down the line. He said, uh, you know, ev everybody that God sent you, you killed because you wouldn't listen to them, because you were a stiff-necked people. You know, you wouldn't listen. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, so Acts 6, again. Stephen was a man full of grace and power, wisdom, as the Spirit gave it to him. So, this is something that we have to know, we have to learn. And we can learn it from Stephen himself that we need to be full of grace and wisdom. Know when to talk, know when not to. Know when to stand up, know when to sit down. You know? And it's, it's part of being who you are in the body of Christ. Let God give you wisdom. He will give you wisdom if you just ask him. He'll give you wisdom if you don't just kind of go off half-cocked and, and you're a reactionary with particular things. You know, it's much better just to kind of sit there and be silent a lot of times and just wait and let the Lord give you wisdom. Okay, go on. Okay, so the current temple, the temple that lives in us, Spirit of God. He's the one that's going to give us all of this wisdom all the knowledge that we need in order to be able to minister, in order to be able to talk to people, in order to be able to talk to our spouses, to talk to our kids. Uh, those of you who have kids, those of you who have grandkids, you know that it takes a lot of wisdom to talk to kids. And if you can, if you can understand and remember where it is that you came from at that age, it's going to be a lot easier to talk to them too. I, I constantly have to remind myself of that. I have to remind myself of that with my grandkids. I have to remind myself of that with my kids. You know, of when I was their age, how did I think? You know, those of you who have teenagers, um, you know, you remember that when we were teenagers that we knew all there was to know about everything. <laughs> and the older we got, the smarter our parents got, right? Because we already knew it all. And when I go back and I look, even as a young minister, at some of the things that I used to say from the pulpit, I used to cringe now, thinking, I was pretty stupid. <laughs> you know? Um, there were a lot of things I got wrong. I remember big blunders of things that I would say from the pulpit and didn't have a chance to correct them. Yeah. So, you know, we've all been there. We've all done that. We've all done that when we are trying to witness to somebody or whether we're trying to minister to somebody, that we just say something stupid, you know, that we 
um, don't use wisdom. We don't use grace. Sometimes we don't close our mouths and we, we run ahead or we do it in the emotion of the moment and, um, and we regret it. I would much rather be quiet and not say something than have to go back and apologize for it because of something stupid that I said or something I said in the heat of anger. And I still have to control that, you know, even at 63 years old. I still have to. But our current temple, this is who we are because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, as you know, if you've read this story, um, people didn't like what Stephen said. They were so mad at him that they began to gnash their teeth, the Bible said. They gritted their teeth at him. That's a lot of anger. And they drug him out and they stoned him. They killed him. Am I saying that when we, uh, when we have wisdom and the spirit and all that stuff that we're going to end up getting killed? No. But um, sometimes, not necessarily, but sometimes things don't always turn out the way that we think that they're going to either. That's just, that's the name of that story. But the interesting thing about it with this story, I'm going to my next slide because I don't remember what it was. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Okay, now I do remember <laughs> what it is. Um, the interesting thing about this is that Ananias and his company, his uh, bunch of cohorts, drug Stephen out and stoned him. Remember when Jesus told the disciples, I am going to go back to my father and I'm going to sit at the right hand of the father. You remember that? Remember that scripture? He says that in this particular scripture, when we look at this, the Bible says that Stephen looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the father. What that tells me is that when one of his kids were in trouble, he wasn't sitting down anymore. He was standing. And there's no doubt in my mind that if Stephen would have asked that God would have sent the angels down to consume him and to consume those, the, those around him. God did it before. He did it with the prophets of Baal with, with Elijah, you know, and just sent fire and, you know, just barbecued them all, burn them all up, right? He did it before. So Jesus is standing at this point looking down at his servant Stephen. And finally, the Bible says that Stephen commended his spirit and, and went ahead and, and died. But the thing was, is that it backfired on Ananias and all of, his, all of his henchmen. Because Stephen being the first martyr now was like mercury when you stomp on it. Because now, all of a sudden, all of Jesus' followers started scattering. And it drove them out of Jerusalem. You remember the story of Elijah, I think it was Elisha, when you sit down by the brook Cherith and um, the ravens came and fed him. You remember that story in the Bible? You know, he was being chased and he sat down, God had him sit down under the tree and uh, <clears throat> he had a brook there. He was by the brook Cherith and he was also being fed by ravens, right? But God had another mission for him because he had to go in and he had to take care of the, the little woman and perform the miracle with the, with the oil that never ran out and all of that kind of thing. But the problem was that Elisha was sitting under the tree and he was comfortable. He was, he was there. God was taking care of him. He was sending the ravens. He was sending the food, all of that type of thing. So in order for God to get him to move from here to here, what happened? He cut off room service. He stopped the ravens and he dried up the brook. And now, Elijah, either you move or you die, right? That's the same way that it was in the early church. Ananias and all of his people, they were persecuting the Christians. And now, of course, they had killed Stephen, the first martyr. But what they had intended to squelch this rebellion that was going on backfired on, on them. And now, all of a sudden, all the people were now starting to leave Jerusalem. And now they were going to go into Judea and Samaria and eventually into the other, othermost parts of the world to evangelize and to spread the gospel. See, um, go ahead and stand. Um, God, uh, God has always had a people. And God has not been nervous about his people. And God has always had a plan. 
we don't think so a lot of times, and we think that it's dark hours and and you know uh, when you know when we had the dark ages and all of those types of things in history, and we had the Nazi regime, and we had uh, you know all of the different things down through the ages that have threatened Christianity. We've had those things, and they have been going on for a long time. But God has always had a plan. He's 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 never caught off guard with any of these types of things, and so He knew that Stephen was going to be martyred. He knew that he was going to get killed, but that was going to be a catalyst to be able to start to expand out from Jerusalem and from the corruptness of the temple. And that's the way that it is with you and me. We go through hard times. We go through hard things. Um, It always amazes me why we wonder that when we become Christians that we're not going to go through hard times we go through hard times a lot of times just because we're human that's just the way that it is but God still always has a plan for us and so um first Peter says but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks and give the reason for the hope that's within you and do this with gentleness and respect you know it's like always have that answer ready no matter where we are, what it is, doesn't matter whether we're at work or school or we are with our kids or with our grandkids or whatever, it's like always have that answer ready whenever God gives us this. And the next uh, slide here is one of my favorite scriptures in the world. Romans 12, I've told you about this before. Do not repay anybody evil for evil. Be careful uh, to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now I am a nine on the Instagram scale. No, it's not Instagram. What is it? Enneagram. It's Enneagram. Okay. Enneagram. There's too many grams. So, okay. So, so I am a nine on the Enneagram scale, which is peaceful mediator. Um, back, back in the day, back in the seventies and the eighties, we used to always take other ones called, um, well, anyway, I was a phlegmatic basically. And so I'm pretty easy going, you know, I'm kind of even Steven with some of that stuff. It's not that I don't get riled sometimes, not that I don't get depressed, uh, all of that type of thing, but, but it's, you know, kind of like this. And so, um, so this is what I've taught my kids for years. And this is what I've tried to live by for years. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And I've always had to remind myself of that. As far as it depends on me, live at peace. That's, that's not always the situation. You can't always do that. But as far as it depends on me, I can live at peace with everybody. Because, because it gets back to what we were talking about. You can't control what other people are doing. You can't control the news and the media and the bad things that are happening in the world. You can't be the Holy Spirit. And you can't, um, you can't embrace those things and take them on yourself. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And this is what God's talking about. This is what God was talking about with Stephen. You know, the gentleness, the, the wisdom, the Holy Spirit giving him direction. Uh, all of those types of things. And what will happen is that when this, when this becomes a part of us, we will begin to filter out and be who we're supposed to be in God. In whatever we do. So if it's possible, as far as it depends on me, live at peace with everybody. Uh, go on to the next one. Mm, go on again. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so, Father, thank you for this uh, time. Thank you that Stephen was a picture of what we need to be. And uh, who our temple is supposed to be. Because you said that you come down and you tabernacle among us. And, and we become your temple. We are your vessel that you and your Holy Spirit come and dwells in so that we can do 
what we're called to do and be who we're called to be. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you uh, that this is how we become the church. And Father, I, I thank you and I, I bless you for doing this for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Next week. Hey, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for agreeing with the word. With the word uh, today. Um, next week we're going to talk about the church and uh, Paul talking about concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. I wouldn't have you be ignorant about this. And so uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 again. The very first part of it. And we're going to kind of explore our spiritual gifts again. And so, you know, kind of kind of be thinking about that a little bit and all. And as I said, I'm not really going to put you on the spot. Um, but you've gotten to know me well enough that that's probably a lie because I probably will put you on the spot. <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, we're going to explore the spiritual gifts and, and various things. So. So let me, wonderful. Anybody have anything else before we, before we stop? Yes, yes please. Um, just a really wonderful part about Tell the, me. the man who is holding the coat. Yes, and actually I do. I, thank you. I, ha, I have that, I have that in my notes and I, you know, it's like I can't stay over there. Yeah, so yes, thank you for reminding me that. Okay, so when you read the story of Stephen, He's there and he's being stoned. They're watching this execution. And the Bible talks about that there was a young man that was there who they said to him, you know, basically, hold, you know, here, hold my beer. You know, basically, you know, hold my coats um, or whatever. And, and there he was, and it was Saul from Saul of Tarsus. And so Saul, who later will become Paul, was there and he was witnessing this. And... Do you not think that that was by divine design that that Saul was there? He probably wanted to be part of that story. He he could he could have been yeah he could have maybe wanted to at that point, and he was there and it it was making an impression on him, and God was starting to uh, deal with him, and we later on in the next few weeks we'll talk about Paul and thank you for reminding me of that because I had I did have that in my notes um, within that so. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, any anything else? No. Okay, good. Okay. Well, as as they as they say in the Bible, let's eat. So.